Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of our new series by Sprout Social, and we're calling it Enter the Chat. We've done several of these broadcasts lately, and we found a strong common thread across all of those conversations, and that's how much connection and community which each other means to social marketers. So the team at Sprout tried to move at the suite of social to kick off this new series that we're calling Enter the Chat, and it's a LinkedIn-first video series welcoming social marketers to the stage and tackling topics and conversations directly relevant to others in the industry. And Enter the chat just will not be as impactful without a key element, you, our viewers. We hope you join us each month as we are episodes diving deep into bite-sized conversations. So be sure to set reminders and enter the chat with us. You do not want to miss an episode. And today, in honor of World Social Media Day coming up on June 30th, we want to look back at the progress that the social industry has made since the very first Social Media Day in 2010, which happens to be the same year Sprout Social was founded. And what better way to unpack the past 14 years than by inviting the founder of Social Media Day himself, Pete Cashmore, and also founder of media and entertainment company, Mashable, to join us. So Pete, thank you hey, so Greg. much for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're so excited for you to enter the chat. I mean, I have to say, as someone who's been in the biz for a while now, I'm pretty excited to be sitting down with you. I remember when I was involved with the Social Media Association of Michigan, I was the president. We got our proclamation for Social Media Day from the governor, and we made a. There was one year we did a whole conference, and so it's just exciting to kind of be looking back and reflecting on everything. Yeah, I didn't know Michigan had declared an official Social Media Day, but I was googling around the other day and I found the proclamation. It was about you know 2015 or something um, that you guys declared it officially Social Media Day, and yeah. a lot of cities as well. I, I remember Vancouver has an official Social Media Day. Um, yeah. Miami, I think, has one. So it's it's all over. Yeah. Well, and I think you even let me know, like, I have a photo of you of the Vancouver Social Media oh boy. Day to show folks. <laughs> that was the age of, would that have been, you know what, if that's 2010, Instagram didn't, maybe just existed. I was thinking maybe that's an Instagram filter, but I was maybe thinking it's, the Instagram filters Maybe too. it's just that we used to take photos on potatoes and this. We had those cameras that on the old iPhones. It was about two years into the iPhone, so maybe that was an, an iPhone photo. Yeah, I love that. Well, I'm excited to kind of like, let's start by like going back in time a little bit. So like, what was top of mind for you and Mashable at the time? And why was social media such a focal point for you? So Mashable started in 2005. Um, and we initially talked about startups and then uh twitter launched and facebook came out of its uh, college only phase and we noticed that this was probably the biggest trend in technology that this was going to overtake the whole internet um and that it was a new distribution channel for media companies it was it was somewhere where we could put our stories so we embraced all of that we got on every single platform um you know most of those platforms launched in the kind of the 2005 to 2000 and 10 era. Um, I want to say Twitter was was a little later, but YouTube was 2005. Yeah. Um, Instagram was 2010. So kind of in that window, all the social platforms launched and Facebook came out of its kind of beta test in colleges. So we thought, hey, we can really engage with this. And through 2005 to 2010, we, we were the social media guide and we pretty much exclusively covered social media. And then over time, we started to also cover what was happening on social media. You know, it started off like, here's the 10 ways that you can uh, create a YouTube video, or yeah. here's here's how to um, uh, create a Twitter account, and here's the stuff you should post. And, you know, the basics, we did a lot of how-tos, and then we started covering more cultural stuff. Of Here's actually what's happening on the networks, because it started to shape culture. It's, it's hard to remember that, in 2005, it was sort of TV was what shaped culture or uh, mainstream music, but but there wasn't internet culture, and it was very kind of niche. And if you were in it, you knew it, but um, if you weren't, you, you had no idea. I remember I went to Tweet Ups during that time, which was a yeah. meetup for people who were on Twitter, and that was a small enough group that you could meet up and sort of know everyone that was on Twitter. That's kind of how early that was. Um, and that was certainly still happening in 2010. And then, of course, that led us to think about, huh, you know, we want to bring our community together. And how could we do that? And Meetup launched a platform called Meetup Everywhere at the time. And they said, hey, brands can uh, create these self-organized events in different cities. So you can go out there and say, hey, it's the social media day page. Do you want to set up a local event? 
Um, so people did that and there's, you know, Social Media Day Miami group and there's Vancouver group and there's ones all over uh, the globe. There was one in Brazil, I remember. Yeah. Um, and yeah, essentially we allowed people to self-organize around the brand. It was almost like, hey, let's take social media into real life. Um, and I think that was really meaningful to people. And I think it's maybe also something that's going to come back around now that we're sort of always on our phones and connecting digitally. It seems like something that my social media managers are going to become community managers again. And it's going to be, hey, we actually want uh, our super fans to meet up in real life. And hey, we actually uh, want to have a Slack or a Discord or a smaller group where people can go from social media, get into sort of a one-to-one -one connection where they feel welcome. And then if they're super fans, meet up in real life. So that was the origin of Social Media Day, which was letting people around the world connect around their love of social media. I love that. Well, and just like, I love the mention of coming full circle too, because it's so important to me and what we're doing at Sprout is like social first really means integration and thinking about like that modality of connection across social. Yes. But like, as you're bringing people to a community, as you're inviting people back to stronger in-person events to connect. And so I, I had a question because I was digging through around the origins of Social Media Day. Any significance around June 30th? You know, I don't recall. I think it was sort of on our minds and yeah. it seemed like social media had really gotten to a peak. I do remember though, and this may have chimed into it. So in 2008, we did the Mashable Summer Tour. Um, and this was the first time I met anyone who worked at Mashable, because I, I I was working in Scotland, I worked nights to kind of sync up with Silicon Valley. Um, and I never met anyone on the team. So it was the first time I met up with anyone's team, but it's also the first time I met any of our readers, our community. Yeah. So we did these meetups all around the United States. I remember we did Seattle, we did DC, we did Miami, I think we did virtually every major city. Um, and I think that went on for a couple of years. I think we might have done another one in 2009. It's a long time ago now. And then I think when 2010 came around, we were thinking, OK, how can we connect with the community? What's new? What's fresh? We've done these meetups um, around the US. What do we do next? And I think it was, oh, well, we could scale this by having people organize their own meetups. And then we could have meetups in cities where we're not able to attend and, and bring Mashable writers. So I think that may have been the genesis. And also just it seemed like social media was really uh, reaching kind of a, a zenith and people were really getting excited about it. I know as I was kind of planning this episode and and putting everything together, I was like, oh, this is a great way to celebrate the end of the half of the year and all the wins of social pros. And so maybe we can reroute it. And uh, if you're on the calendar year or just the end of a quarter, like that's how I was kind of, this is a fun conversation to bring Pete in and we're celebrating the end of half of the year and all the stuff we did as a social team. So maybe we can create that and make it happen. <laughs> I, I also think this time of year, people just want to meet up. I mean, we're, we're deep in yeah. conference season. Um, and I think this is, this is when people want to get outside. The weather is generally nicer around the country and people want to get out and meet up. Yeah, before we kind of zoom ahead, I actually dug up a little footage from uh, one of the first social media days from someone in this room, might be you, might be me, but I, I might show a few seconds if you're okay with that. This is like hot ones where you do that crazy level of research, you're just on edge, or it's like, what's he going to bring up? Okay, yeah, yeah, we can take a look. Let's take a look. All right, cool. Hi, I'm Pete Cashmore, the founder of Mashable, and we'd like to welcome you to the very first Social Media Day. Social Media Day is celebrating the revolution of media, the way in which media is becoming more social and helping to connect us. You're at one of over 500 Social Media Day events. There's more than 5,000 people celebrating around the world today. Wow. I mean, a blast from the past. I'd forgotten that there were 500 meetups. That is, that's quite scaled, yeah. Um, I mean, it just shows the importance into your like earlier point, the hunger for that connection and bringing people together. And so let's kind of fast forward, like, so between 2010 today, like, what are some of the key evolutions you've seen change? And like, what do you see today in the industry and overall looking like? Wow, there's so much, I think. Firstly, it went from obviously being a niche thing where all the social media managers sort of knew each other. Um, secondly, you know, I think it's it's become scaled and mainstream. Um, I think it's become professionalized. So it it originally uh, Twitter now X was your personal updates, what you had for lunch. Now it is um, creators, influencers, brands, 
media companies, and of course, still individuals. Um, but it's a lot more topically focused now. It used to be um, sort of more about what you're doing in a, in a personal blog or a diary. It went from blogging to people uh, tweeting or posting on Facebook. And now when you go to those platforms, there's um, a bit more kind of professionalization, a bit more level of standard. And it's almost like broadcast TV. It's so premium. You know, we can watch TikTok yeah. instead of watching TV. Wait, YouTube videos, the, the quality there is just crazy now. I watch documentaries on YouTube and they're flying drones and Wild. they've got all yeah. these dolly shots. And I'm just like, wow, this production value is better than what I used to watch on TV. So the professionalization has definitely happened. The scale has definitely happened. I think we're probably at the phase now where we won't have any more scaled platforms, where we won't see, oh, there's this new social network uh, come up and we all need to get on it really quickly. And that was really the phase from about 2005 to 2010, maybe a bit later, where every time a new social network uh, came up, we had to scramble. Um, sweating, yeah. <laughs> I think the tone did change a little bit over that time, but I'm still pretty optimistic as well about social media because, you know, in, in sort of that period, there was a lot of optimism about social media empowering people to have a voice. And I think now that we're used to it and it's like water, we've kind of forgotten that uh, we didn't used to be so empowered. We didn't used to mm. be able to just snap a photo and put it out to the world and tell our own side of the story. There were there were a lot of gates to media, right? It was it was something where if you wanted to be interviewed, you had to go on a mainstream television network, and now you can just pop on a podcast and yeah. you can get your own narrative out there. It's not you know necessarily that um, you have to agree to sort of a, a a narrative that someone else puts out there. So I think there's a lot of empowerment that's happened with social media, there's obviously, um, you know, things that you have to figure out when a new technology comes up that are downsides. But I do think we'll kind of remember this period as, wow, this was the time when everyone got a voice. I appreciate that a lot. And, to, and we mentioned this right before we started jumping in is like, the consumption of us, like I even mentioned before this, like thumb stopping content, right? Like that was our like focus. Uh, like if you got someone to stop on that content, especially with all these competing platforms popping up as a brand or an individual, that was a win. What do you think that looks like now or maybe over the next couple of years? Is that still the case? Okay, well, I guess let's talk about the present. So the present is the platforms are scaled. Probably not going to see a new one. You probably yep. don't as a social media manager need to jump on, hey, we just invented a brand new uh, mobile app and it's going to be the next week's social network because yep. these things have network effects, right? So yeah. um, once a platform has really gotten to scale, it's quite hard to unseat it. And also the basics of these platforms are already established. We have the feed. We have the ability to share different types of media, right? It was text-based early on, but now it's text. And it's also photos. And it's also, so that was sort of Instagram in 2010. It's yep. also video, right? Um, and that was allowed by, you know, broadband connections and people having mobile phones in their pocket all of the time. Um, so... I think I completely lost my train of thought there, but I, I think, um, oh yeah, I think that's happened. I think that's that scale has happened. I think there's yep. not going to be new platforms. I think that whole box is figured out. And I think the next phase, there's kind of a micro phase, uh, which is going to be the AI based autom automation of all that stuff, right? We're going to have a couple of years where it's just, we're doing the same stuff, but we're doing it faster. We're doing it better. We're doing it um using these ai tools so what does that look like it might look like uh there's really three phases on the creation phase it's going to look like hey i'm going to use ai to create the social assets on the distribution phase it's going to be hey i'm going to press one button it's going to go to all the networks and it's going to be cut up correctly for each network and it's going to be optimized yep. what people like on that social network and then there's the analytics phase right which is um how do you do social listening? How do you bring all that in and use machine learning to analyze all that scale? It used to be, I remember we would go through and like look at tweets. So what are people saying about our articles? Did they like it? And then we created this tool called Velocity that kind of automated a lot of that and also predicted um, what stories people were gonna wanna have. So we can talk about the next two years first. And then I think I'd like to talk about, oh, what's gonna happen like next in social media? What does that 
uh, look like. But so on the creation side, okay, what do we use? We use Canva right now, a lot of social media managers. Um, that is getting more and more AI. I think eventually, like right now, there's the magic things. I think they just did a, a yeah. presentation where they announced a lot of stuff. Eventually, I think that looks like you just come up with the ideas and then you type it in and it makes the asset. You're not going to, you're not trying to go find rights managed photos. You're not trying to figure out how do I remove the background of this, which thing is in the foreground, which title, which font. I think that all gets figured out because it's just going to be indexing the whole web, figuring out generally when people make this social asset, 90% of them want it to look like this. And then you'll tweak around the edges and you'll post it. On the distribution side, it's um, kind of the same thing. Hey, we've cut this up for reels and for shorts and for every other network and press this button if this looks good and we're going to publish it automatically. Yeah. You. And Absolutely. then on the social listening side, which I know you guys at Sprout are really big on, I think it's just that because all these things are scaled, that uh, you just want to know what are people thinking? What What is the narrative out there? Why did this thing hit? You know, I was thinking the other day about um, his new Inside Out movie, Inside Out 2. Yeah. And it's been all the buzz on social, and it kind of defies a lot of what I thought the narratives were about movies, right? People aren't going to go to theaters anymore. They got out of the habit of going to theaters and uh, theaters are too expensive now because we've got, you know, inflation and um, things are really expensive or people don't want sequels. That's why people aren't going to theaters. And then you have this blockbuster hit and you're like, what is the reason? And I think you could <laughs> go into the, all the social listening data and just be like, why was this a hit? Was there a bunch of influencers went the first day and suddenly they were putting out positive reviews and then it took off. So social listening at scale where you're not just trying to come up with a narrative, right? Where you're actually getting data that tells a narrative. Um, and then, yeah, moving forward, wow. I think we're gonna have kind of a an age of AI where it really starts to change things, right? I think there's gonna be a phase of yeah. AI where it's just, hey, we're automating what we're already doing. And for social media managers, that's fantastic, right? Because, hey, I don't really love uh, spending all my time making social assets or managing each individual platform. I just wanna come up with a crazy idea. I wanna be human, right? I wanna be like Wendy's, I wanna be unhinged. I wanna <laughs> just like, like be a human on these networks and not just put out, um, predictable, boring stuff. But then I think there's another phase where it starts to change everything and it gets interesting. And also we can't really see that far. One of the things that's going to happen is sort of AI influencers on social media. Yep. So I, I mean, there's already a few and I know that uh, TikTok has been experimenting with sort of, you can make ads with, I think actors they pre-recorded, but I guess eventually um, uh, people who are, who are just uh, AI avatars. Um, so you're going to be competing with them and you're also going to start competing to make interesting content with just all the AI bots that are going to make really compelling content and also all the other social media managers who are using these tools and putting out 10 times the amount, you're going to have like the 10 X social media manager, you know, yeah. they're the 10 X developer, but they're going to be able to put out so much more stuff because they're just going to, their whole job's going to be think of the idea and just put it out there. Um, so there's going to be a wave of competition as AI comes in and, and maybe that gets more challenging. Um, so yeah, I think that that phase, which is probably in like the two to five year era is harder to predict. And then after that, I think you're going to have a new devices era, um, where, we completely go away from the the mobile phone. The mobile phone will, so because you can talk to this stuff, right? And yeah. that makes a huge difference. So I don't know if you've seen. I've got I've got a prop here, right? This is the Meta AI. Oh, nice. Practice. Yes. And um, so basically, I put them on the pretty door key right now. But I think they're going to make them smaller and smaller. I'm going to get some reflections. I mean, here. not bad, honestly. Like as but, someone who wears glasses, yeah. Well, you know, they're made by uh, Ray Ban. So yeah. that's why they kind of have, and they brought out a new version, I think, that's even cooler and a, a, a better shape. But um, it's actually talking to me right now, so I'm going to take it off. Um, so I think when you think about, okay, you're wearing these glasses, um, you have a camera, you can ask it questions. 
But what does that mean for social media? How am I going to read social media? So yeah. text is probably not going to be a thing. If this is actually how we interact with computers in a major way, text is probably less of a thing. Probably audio is important. Maybe podcasts keep being important because essentially you're going to be wearing your computer on your face all the time and talking to it. And it's going to be giving you answers like this. You can point at a plant and say, what plant is this? Right. You can, and it will take a look and it will tell you, Hey, it's this, it's a rose <laughs> or whatever, um, which is cool. But also from a media production standpoint, you're like, well, how are people going to consume my stuff? How are they going to consume social media? So I think that audio will be big. I also actually think that video will be pretty big going forward in social media because these don't do it, but I have I have a really old school prop. I don't know if you've seen this, but this is uh, Google Glass, right? <laughs> What and a this blast. Thing, Holy cow. And this, this is an old, this is an old, old thing. This did not take off, but I think we're gonna look back and say, like, this was the Apple Newton. This was actually like really forward looking and probably the future. It just looks dorky. But you can That's watch YouTube way. videos while you walk around on this thing and talk to it. And um essentially, well, I'll put it on and look dorky, but um will it go on? There we go. Um, you can watch a video like out of this and it's got like a prism where it's going to project it. So when you think about social media in the future, I think a lot about, okay, if the devices are going to be more integrated with us, right? If it's going to be glasses or it's going to eventually be a chip that just like connects your brain, you just think stuff, then what media will you consume? You'll probably consume less text because I don't know mm -hmm. if you've seen those Apple Vision demos, but like text on Apple Vision VR is just hard to read. Yeah. Um, and I think... Video and audio were just the leaders there. And then I think about, okay, well, if you're like making stuff for social media, what do you want to make? Because you're thinking about, okay, AI can convert all the media into stuff. And also people might be consuming it on glasses or a phone or other devices that we haven't thought of yet. And it needs to be converted into every single format, right? So I think about video is like the top, oh. top format because it's the most information dense, right? We're talking, we have a visual feed, we have audio, it can easily transcribe what we're saying and make a text based thing and make an article about it, make a newsletter. So I still see video as sort of the top, top medium. And then maybe podcasting and audio is a second medium uh, in this era. And I think that also intersects with the way that um, uh, we'll all want more human connection, like we want yeah. more human media, because we'll be like, for a while, video will be like, oh, I know this is actually Greg. You know what I mean? Like, like he's talking to us for a while, yeah. for, for like a couple of years. And yeah. we'll crave that, I think, because text will be like, wait, is this AI generated? This seems a bit strange. It's, and I think we'll also prize the connections with humans a lot. So I think video will probably be the best medium for brands and creators to post in going forward. I don't know what happens once you can sort of automate that or create virtual influencers or even when you can do the inverse, right? Which is take a text-based newsletter or your, you know, yeah. your update on X and then say, make this a video. Make this a video of me saying this thing. Um, that is a whole new world. But I, I really see video as sort of the one thing that we can trust will work for a while. And then I also think more broadly about, hmm, how do we be human in this world? Like if exactly, we're if we're yeah. creators, if we're if we're the person behind the screen. And that's why it comes back to like, oh, that meetup everywhere thing was actually kind of a good idea. Maybe brands will start saying, hey, our super fans are all going to actually meet up in the real world. Or maybe it's about personality. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently is um, uh, I think personal narrative is going to be super important because I've been listening to um, this is going to expose me. But like <laughs> if you think about like Taylor Swift, I don't know if you're yeah. a Swifty, right? Yes. Um, the... Or 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 the Drake beef, right? These are personal narratives, right? You can have AI write a song um, about a relationship, but the reason people really engage with those and then try to find the Easter eggs and come read it and have these huge threads about who is this song about and what phase of her life is this about yeah. and who's this one about? It's because it's personal narrative and it's human, right? And we can relate to it. And as much as the AI can write a song that sounds like Taylor Swift, or sounds like uh, Drake, it doesn't have that narrative. You don't know um, the personal story that's behind it. And I think personal narrative is gonna become more and more important because it's going to be something that AI does not have. 
Um, so that's a lot of ideas uh, about the future yeah. of all this stuff. I think that's huge, though, because I think, you know, one of, AI has been no stranger over the past year. But that's what a very compelling case of why social teams specifically like need tools to help them free up that time to allow for that narrative, that storytelling. You talk about distribution, like finding a tool that not only allows you faster content creation within Canva, but integrates like with Sprout. So you can easily like have it created and omni-channeled out to each of the platforms. Um, so that's the distribution. And then you have things like listening so you can better understand your audiences. Like if you have a product launch, if you have um, Inside Out 2 and you're looking for those nuggets of insights to then craft that. And so I think that's a huge case for why social teams need to have tools to free up time. So like what are some of the tools that you see over the coming years um, being most intentional where social team members maybe need to move through that discomfort, right? And focus on freeing up their time so they can do what will unlock, like whatever that new thumb stopping content looks like. So one thing is I think there will always be omni-channel tools like Sprout, and here's why. Um, the platforms will never... Um, produce stuff that lets you post to other platforms, right? So if you're a creator, if you're a brand, you want to be able to put your campaigns across everything. So you need something that unifies um, all of the platforms. And, and it's all quite siloed. For a while, I thought, wow, the platforms are really going to run away with everything. Certainly in terms of advertising, um, you can buy with Meta and get a lot of reach across a lot of different platforms, which is fantastic. But it turns out people still want that diversity of platforms. They want to be able to post stuff to multiple platforms. And actually, as the platforms have developed more similar feature sets, it's become more required, right? It's, okay, I have short form video. I have a lot of places I can post short form video. Um, so you need those centralizing tools. I think in general, when people think about adopting new tools, they should probably wait. I think, like I was saying, that era of, hey, let's jump on every new tool. Absolutely. Is maybe not going to be as fortuitous or as um, fruitful um, this time around, because I think we do have platforms at scale, and I think they're the ones that are best able um, to develop some of this stuff, like Canva, right? Is you could certainly try a new startup that is letting you produce stuff automatically but i think in you know six months to a year suddenly there's you know a, a text box where you can type and create anything um so i i don't think it's necessarily a case of jumping on everything i think when you think about skills you want to learn for this i actually think prompt management is probably going to be one of the or prompt engineering i guess yep. is um going to be one of the most important which is sort of this idea of how do I get the computer to do the thing I want it to do? And I, I for a while, thought prompts are just going to be kind of like there's all these marketplaces for prompts and there's people who teach you how to prompt. And I thought that was all going to go away because the computer would figure out what we mean. I think more and more, actually, language is going to be incredibly important. Um, and we're strangely going to a world where um, being maybe a computer programmer is, you know, it's still an awesome job, but some of that stuff can get done by the AI, but say trying to create an image or a piece of text, you need to understand language. So it's kind of like we've had this era in corporate America for sort of decades where the math people um, just really got ahead. And I think Peter Thiel was talking about this. And now it's kind of the era of the, of the word people where suddenly like, oh, we can actually explain to this thing what we need. And you need to be so specific when you're describing you want an outcome, you want a brand logo, whatever. You really need to understand all the terms that describe that. So I think when it comes to skills, actually developing the ability to engineer prompts and get the exact thing you want uh, immediately. In terms of mastering tools, I think just being open to them, maybe playing around with these new tools, seeing what's possible. There's tons of good YouTube channels 
um, about AI. There's about a zillion newsletters. I had a phase where I went, where I subscribed to 10 of them and then I kind of cut down, um, stopped yeah. binging AI news, you know, around <laughs> the launch of chat GPT. I was just yeah. obsessed. I was like, oh, I have to know everything about all this AI stuff. And there were tools launching every day. But now I've come to the conclusion that I don't need to follow it. And actually the, I can just kind of keep an eye on the news, see what's going to be possible down the line and then wait for the major platforms to integrate it. So I don't think there's any sort of new tools that people need to have uh, in their quiver. I just think they need to maybe be practicing using prompts in their day-to-day -day life and getting better and better at that skill. I love that. So it sounds like overall, like a lot of optimism in the coming years from you. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's going to get easier probably for a couple of years. There are challenges. And like I was saying, one of the biggest challenges is like the AI is going to make a bunch of content and you're competing yeah with all that content. And then another challenge is um, how popular do virtual influencers get? And then obviously a third challenge is, hey, we can make really believable content that isn't real. And how does that you know, affect our trust in brands and, uh, and even in individuals where, it could, oh, is this person really saying this or not? So there are certainly challenges, but I think throughout history, we have sort of created new things, made them, you know, made them really improve our lives and then dealt with some of the challenges like cars, you know, if we invented cars today would be like, oh my goodness, these things, they pollute, they make the city noisy, <laughs> yeah. they occasionally crash. Like it would be like, we can have zero car crashes. Like you can't, remember when they launched cars, you had to have, um, someone with a flag running in front of it, warning people. So you couldn't go faster than someone walking because they're like, this is too dangerous. And then we invented seatbelts and we invented airbags and cars became a lot, lot safer over time or airplanes, right? The airplanes were invented. They had all kinds yeah. of problems. The windows would come out and like, oh, we can't have square windows. We have to round the corners. We didn't know that. And now they're basically safer than being in your house. So I think there's definitely some stuff uh, we almost need to balance social media in our lives. Like we got so this new thing, we got so excited and now it's like, okay, how do I use it intentionally? How do I use it for the things that are beneficial to me and decide to use it and decide, Hey, at dinner time, I'm actually going to talk to my family and turn off the phone. Um, so I think it's great to have this level of abundance. I just don't think we've gotten used to abundance yet. And it's the same thing with, um, you know, seeing everyone's lives all the time. It's like, oh, there's so much opportunity. Now we have the problem of, I can see all the different jobs I could have. I could see all the different trips I could be taking. And it's it's sort of a, a good problem to have that we have abundance of uh, ideas and possibilities, but we're also getting a little overwhelmed and we're going to need to get to a phase of life where we say, here are the things I've defined that are important to me. And I'm not going to just let the uh, the internet define uh, me and what's important. I'm going to make choices because I don't think we have quite adapted yet to having all of the world's information at our fingertips 24 seven. Like we, 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 we come from an era, like we were scarcity animals, right? It was like, um, you wouldn't be, like the amount of information you'll get in a year is probably the amount you get in a couple of days from being on the internet. And we just kind of gorge on it. We're like, I want to know, I want to know. And even I find myself doing that, like watching a movie and I'm like, oh, who is that? Oh yeah. What, what else were they in? Oh yeah. And then suddenly you're just completely yeah. on your phone in a different world. So I, think, yeah. I think it's good to have that. Like I wish I'd had that when I was a kid, just act. I would always ask my dad like, why, 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 why? And he wouldn't know he'd get, you'd get to the end of it. And I would go on Encarta. I don't know if you remember that, but I had like an yeah. encyclopedia on uh, my computer and I would go, cause we didn't have internet. And I would go like, Oh, what, how do space rockets work? And we have like videos of space rockets, but that was it. Once you got to the end of that, but now there's no yeah. end to the internet. You're just on Wikipedia pages going deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole to 2 a.m. And social media is the same. It's like, oh, you know, oh, I can check in with that friend. And oh, what's new here? And oh, I'm getting recommended videos. And I think that's fundamentally good that we have access to all that stuff. We just need to learn how to live in an abundant society and make choices.
I think that's great. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about sophistication at Sprout when it comes to business, like knowing how to pull through the data that comes from social. Like if you think of like the amount of content out there, the information that you can pull through and like knowing how to pull it through, like using a CRM, like integrations, like getting it in the right hands of product engineering at the right time in your C-suite. But also to your point, like it's the sophistication of users as well. And I I see like changes over generations. We had a recent report and we found like Gen Z, actually there's a stat, they care a little bit less about authenticity and um, like they want to lean into like, they're actually okay with uh, AI influencers. And so I think the media and digital literacy of consumers, but also like how do we leverage and balance that information and content distribution as business too, like that will be something that will propel brands forward. And I think honestly, when you talked about earlier, the hinged or unhinged, like we actually did a post recently as Sprout because we were looking at that and there's a lot of rhetoric around that. But I think what some of those brands do well is they get their social media out there in a way that resonates with their audiences and consumers. And it has impact all the way up to earnings calls to bottom line for the business. And so I think what this sounds like you're talking about is like, we need to figure out more social sophistication from business, from brands, as consumers. Yeah, what you're saying is social listening is actually very similar to the idea of intentionality in in social media consumption. It's gone from a social media manager being like, let me, uh, we used to have tweet deck and you would you would open it up and you would get all the posts from Twitter now X and they'd be in columns and you'd be tracking your hashtag, you'd be tracking your handle and you'd be trying to manually see and create a narrative of what are people saying? And now you don't have to do that. You'd be like, I'm not gonna go on and check every single hashtag post. I'm just gonna go into my tool and it's gonna summarize. So it's kind of, it is the same thing for social media managers. I wanna come back to that point about authenticity though. What does that mean? Does that mean that Gen Z kind of know they're being, or Gen Z, I guess I would say, they know they're being marketed to and they're like, hey, just be upfront about it. We know that people kind of make money on the internet and just say that you're doing that. Or or what does that mean? Yeah, I think like the data point is like follower count and authenticity. They're really leaning away from authenticity. And I think one thing for me, I think it has become a buzzword, right? But I think like what that looks like is they know to your point when they're being sold to. And so being upfront, knowing that there's like value alignment, whether it's a influencer and brand partnership or just Mm -hmm. brands marketing to consumers. I think that's how I interpreted that data point. So I think it's very similar that they're leaning away from it in that regard of just hearing the word overall. They grew up almost with like, I was still of the, I'm like middle 91 millennial. And so I had some years without like a tablet, internet and social media, of course, and then shifted in there. Whereas like there, I think they have more exposure and so they, they can suss out a little bit more of that. And so I think they're really looking for values, alignment, transparency, and what's happening here. And the stat about them being open to AI influencers, I think it's just about that exposure and familiarity with the platforms. And so they're open to hearing and seeing and exploring a little bit more than maybe other generations might be, or people within generations to not generalize even. Yeah, I remember in the early days of sort of sponsorship, that was icky, that was selling out. That was like not cool. That was the rock band has sold out to the man. And if you had, you know, Instagrammers weren't, you know, um, promoting things and now, uh, that's the way it, we understand that's that's how um, the product is made, right? That you, you have to fund your travel around the world and, and that's fine if we're getting value out of it. So yeah, I do, I do remember that transition. Yeah. Um, and then you spoke a bit about follower count and does, you know, one of the things I think about that has changed since um, 2010 is maybe followers don't, matter as much and maybe the ai because we're already in the ai era just figures out what i want and shows me stuff so it doesn't matter if greg has one follower or a million followers if he creates great content that i'm likely to engage with the algorithm can figure that out because that that algorithmic trend is actually relatively new it kind of came along with tiktok before that there were algorithms but they weren't so precise as to be able to read your mind and serve you up 
exactly yeah. what you want. So I think there's these topical graphs that have kind of risen up where it's it's sort of more like a customized TV channel rather than, hey, here's what your friends are saying. It's like, you don't know you're going to be interested in this, but boy, when we load up this video, um, you're going to really enjoy this. And then that brings me to maybe like a, a really crazy time of AI, which might be the thing that really becomes disruptive, which is what happens when the AI can create videos that are realistic, that exactly match your interests, but were made on the spot for you when compute is so cheap. You know, it's, it says, okay, Pete really likes cats, but like we can make them 10x cuter and we can just like <laughs> give a feed of this. And then it's like not even real or, you know, you like cute puppies and it's like, here's the cutest puppy you've ever seen. And then it, it just can generate whatever it is, the exact intersection of your interests um, is exactly aligned because, you know, YouTube kind of does it, it kind of knows like, yeah, oh, yeah you're interested. Seems like you're interested in the future. Seems like you're interested in transport. Seems like you like Japan. Oh, here's Japan's most futuristic trains. I'm like on it, you know? But imagine when that's like generating stuff and narratives and content that's exactly made for me. Um, I think that will create an abundance problem where I'm like, I really need to put this down. This is like too perfect. And I'm just going to spend my whole life on this. But it also creates yeah. a challenge for human creators to say, how do I be more interesting than that? Right. It's already a problem when you're like sitting uh, lunch with your friends and it's like, are they more interesting than social media right now? Is it? Are they, are they you know, I could have my TikTok might have something more interesting than this conversation. You already yeah. have to pace yourself. So I think once AI can generate the perfect content, not just the perfect feed of content that already exists, but the perfect custom content for you. That is probably the period where we're like, whoa, we're in new world now. This is that is the period where social media kind of becomes something else because it's completely made by the computer. Yeah, I think a lot of things to think about. Hopefully our viewers today have found some some nuggets to think about. We're sadly speeding away from time. So I wonder to close things out to help our viewers get to know you a little bit. If you'd be up for a rapid fire, kind of this or that. Yeah, let's do it. Amazing. Okay, so it's more of like, what are some of your favorites over the years? So first off, what would you say a favorite meme would be of yours? It's got to be... Grumpy Cat. We we actually had Grumpy Cat for uh, at South by Southwest, I think, twice. That cat is super cute. It's super well behaved. I'd say my second would be Boo, the cutest dog in the world. I don't know if you remember Boo. Absolutely. This was yes. the era where you could have um, an, a cute animal and that would just kill on social media that would everyone would just be obsessed. I can't believe that there's a cute animal here. Like the, those were the the uh, early days when when that could actually go viral but yeah that cat is fantastic that's so funny yeah one of my favorites right now is hammy the corgi on tiktok because we have a corgi and so right i'm a big fan the cute animals get me every time all right i love that how about like a little bit different a viral moment over the years like what are some that you really lean into you know i was thinking about this this week i mean it's got to be when you think of a moment i think of award shows um and what was that what was that one um was it john travolta it was like this azim <laughs> do you remember that? Manzel, yes <laughs> yeah 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 so it was supposed to be adina menzel is that right correct yes and what did he say adele nazim or adele something very nazim. similar yeah like, huh so that was a fun period when it kind of intersected with we were all watching everything at the same time you know these like like the super bowl would create viral moments because everyone was still sitting down to watch the Super Bowl at the same time and it was something everyone could talk about. It was kind of when the monoculture connected with internet culture, right? And then everyone was just like, what, yeah. what did he say? Is that and it still happens from time to time, but I think we now live in our own algorithms and we're not quite as united around a singular event, like a singular Super Bowl ad or a singular award show moment or like the um the viral selfie. Do you remember when Ellen took the selfie at the award show? Yeah. Set of words. Yeah, I yeah, went yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah. Bradley yeah, Cooper yeah. and everyone. Yes. Yeah. So that was the same. It was like, hey, take like selfies are mainstream. It's hard to believe now. That was another thing. It's amazing how much social acceptance 
changes because taking a selfie in public used to be super vain and self-involved. And now you walk around and there's just like people recording themselves at the supermarket. You yeah. can't walk down the street in New York City without being accosted by a TikTok interviewer asking you what you do for work or yeah. how's your dating life or... Um, so yeah, that was a different era. But I, I liked that that time when uh, we had these sort of mass viral moments that we all felt connected. I love that. Well, and speaking of connection, I'm sure you like you met many people and like experienced moments of connection over the years. Is there one that stands out? Oh boy, I you know the first thing I go to is is that so is that Mashable tour we did in I think 2008 where we met I met the Mashable staff for the first time and then I also met the readers for the first time oh. because you know you can say oh we have a million readers or we have five million readers, but everyone knows when you're looking at dashboards all the time like that is a number you don't say oh wait this is a person with a story and people would say stuff like oh I became a social media manager because I was reading Mashable and my company didn't have anyone on social media so I decided just to sort of learn the tools and that's now my career and all of those people are you know now CMOs or have moved up the the rankings VPs um so I think that was kind of a moment where I'm like oh yeah if you take this online thing and make it real um, that can be something really powerful. I think this is great. I think we could do probably five more episodes of this, but we are sadly, unfortunately, out of time. And so, Pete, I just want to say on behalf of everyone here at Sprout, like, I'm just so grateful you joined this episode of Enter the Chat. It was truly a fantastic episode to celebrate, like, where we've come, the progress of the industry, and, like, uplifting the impactful work that social media marketers across the world have done. And so I definitely think we'll maybe have to do a follow-up in the future, hopefully without waiting another 14 years or so, if you're down for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love that. Oh, and I have a plug. Can yeah, I do a plug? Absolutely. Um, How can I just people started, find you? Yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and I've also just started, I'm at Pete Cashmore, and I've also just started interviewing creators. I have this new thing called Money Makers. It's I guess it's a LinkedIn newsletter. It's a regular newsletter. Perfect. It's video. I'm trying everything on LinkedIn, see what works. Um, but yeah, follow my LinkedIn and also subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter and then the new stuff I make, you will receive in your inbox. Perfect. I am a proud subscriber, so we'll definitely make sure to drop the links below so folks can subscribe if they're interested, because I think there's a lot to follow in that industry. So appreciate, again, you stopping by, Pete, and we'll definitely have you over again soon. Thanks so much, Greg. Bye for now. Thanks, Pete. Amazing. What a wonderful conversation. Um, as always, to our viewers, thank you. We're so excited to have you have joined us as we premiere future episodes. So please be sure to enter the chat with us again next month. We have some very exciting guests and conversations lined up. So until next time, make sure that you stay connected and stay social. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.